Okay. Let's see. Welcome everybody. Got my chat going. You say hello. Got my coffee, got my guitar, I'm in my studio. It's really good to be here. I love doing these. I think this is my third one. I've been with True Fire now since uh, 2013. I have two series that they've shot. The first one was called Blues Grit, and the second one was called Focus on Power Trio. I've always played in a power trio in a front of my own band, the Kelly Ritchie Band, Blues Based Rock. And now I have a power duo with Sherry McGee, which is uh, reminiscent of like the White Stripes, Flat Keys, Flat Duo Jets. And so we just released uh, three new videos here in the last, let's see, the first one was on Christmas Eve, I believe we, we released the first one. So I'll put some links up to some of this. But tonight I want to talk a lot about um, how to put together a solid practice routine. I have so many students, uh, you know, everything on YouTube, I mean, there's a million guitar instruction videos. You can learn, you can learn how to build a house. You can learn how to take a car apart. You can learn how to do anything on YouTube. But that doesn't mean that you really know how to put together a practice routine, where to place your time and your focus. And, uh, you know, people come to me and they've learned pieces and parts of a million different songs, but they don't have the confidence to go to a jam session and play. Or when they're putting together a band, they're not sure what their next steps are. So I work with a lot of students on everything from playing guitar to how to, you know, do things in their career. I've done 16 CDs, uh, toured all over the United States, Canada, overseas. So I have a lot of life experience when it comes to being a player. But when I first learned how to play, I practiced 16 hours a day, at least 12 to 16 hours a day. And I'm not kidding about that. But when I was first playing, I mean, cable TV, it didn't exist. Uh, the, you know, TV stations went off at, at like, you know, after the, you know, at like midnight, one o'clock. So there wasn't that much to do. And so practicing, I never took this out of my hands. Uh, I slept with my guitar. And today in society, things are really busy. People are, are really taxed for time and we're on all the time. So people are trying to carve out, out, you know, pockets of time where they can learn how to play effectively. And some of the things that students say most is, um, you know, maybe they, they have high hopes of I'm going to have a great practice week. And then first day or two, they get knocked out of the box. It's like, ah, this week's shot. The week is not shot. And I tell my students, do not practice more than 20 minutes a day. Okay. At least if you can practice more than that, do two 20 minute chunks because practice is when you're literally working. And if you're having fun, that's probably not practice, okay? So I want you to practice for 20 minutes, then throw everything out the window and play and have fun. That way, at least you're staying in touch with the guitar if you don't have a lot of time to play during the course of the day or during the course of the week. If you can grab your guitar and run through your finger exercises, grab your guitar. Uh, if, you're, if you're new to the guitar, relatively new, I'm going to show you a couple of, uh, of kind of go-to things to do when you grab your guitar. The biggest thing we want to do is build a connection with our instrument. As long as I've been playing, uh, a couple of years ago, I came off the road from constant touring. Uh, I was doing, I've done as many as 275 shows in one year. Uh, typically, I ran about 125 to 175 shows every year. And... Um, downsizing and mainly playing festivals and uh, more targeted dates and not just living on the road. Um, I've had to really make sure that I keep a guitar in my hands during the course of the week 
and uh, stay in, in, in touch with the neck so I don't lose my feel. And it's been, it's always shocking to me when, um, when I'm not touring all the time, which hasn't been very often in my life. I took a little time off in 2010. But um, the guitar, when you pick it up and it feels a little strange, that's, that's not something I'm used to. So here's what I have my students do every day. There's three finger exercises that I find to be critical. And you'll find these three finger exercises in my Blues Grit and in my Focus on Power Trio series. And uh, they're like a Swiss Army knife if you're going camping or backpacking or something. They get, they're chromatic and they get all four fingers working. And they get, obviously, your left and right hand working. So the first one is... It's just a chromatic exercise where you're going one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And no matter how many times I show this to a new student, they'll not realize that they're doing a couple of things. They'll pick their fingers up. What you want to do is lay your fingers down. And you want to get as close to the fret as possible. You want to get as close to the fret as possible without being right on top of it. You want to let the fret do the work for you. And there's a sweet spot. If you're first starting, you'll, I noticed that students, they push really hard and they have to because they're trying to find that, that, that sweet spot. So if there's anything that you've ever done that's become second nature to you, it takes very, very little effort once you find that right spot. So take advantage of an exercise like this to find right where that sweet spot is where you can use the least amount of effort and lay your fingers down as you go, which will require you to really stretch. Now, a lot of times people will say, I can't reach that. Well, if I put a $100 bill on the table and had them play the exercise, they do what they had to do to be able to reach that. So look at how long my fingers are if I sit like this. Then if I bring my elbow underneath the neck of my guitar, my fingers grow <laughs> tremendously. Okay, so drop your shoulder, get underneath the guitar, and make sure that when you're practicing, you're sitting in a position that you can practice. Sitting on the couch, sitting like a banana, sitting where you can't really have access to the neck of your guitar, it's not a good way to practice. If you want to sit around and play that way, okay, but don't practice that way, all right? And if uh, you're getting ready to, like, start playing live, uh, you'll want to begin strapping on your guitar and doing some of your routine standing up playing because there's a big difference between standing and playing and sitting and playing, okay? So the first finger exercise is just one, two, three, four, all the way across. Slide up. Four, three, two, one, four, three, two, one, four, three, two, one. Now I want to create a pulse. And if you can see my left leg, it's tapping. See how I'm emphasizing that first note? Because I want to be locked in. And when people sit and play and they don't move, that's not good. You want to feel what you're doing. So a lot of times it's a good, it's it's a really good idea to just sit with your guitar and tap your foot and tap on the guitar to where you're feeling rhythm, okay? Three, four, one, two, three, four. Little things like this are imperative. One and two and three and four and one, two, three, four. One and two and three and four and one, two, three, four, one and two and three and four and one and a two and a three and a fifty and a one, two, three, 
four. That's the best rhythm exercise you can do. A lot of people struggle with rhythm. And I mean, you've got this foreign object in your hand. Uh, some people, they don't like a pick. And I say, uh, at least in my world, I'm not great at finger picking. If I set the, the pick down, I'm, I'm not lost. I've played forever and I, you know, I don't, I'm not lost, but I'm not, I'm not classically trained. Um, I use, now I use my fingers, but I use them in conjunction with a pick. So I tell them, carry your pick around with you. Just like, you know, you've seen a drummer twirl on their sticks. And they never set them down. Just carry it with you. This is one thing you can do throughout the day. That's practice practice holding your pick and that may sound kind of ridiculous but it's not this is this is your paintbrush i use a dunlop 60 dunlop nylon 60 if you can see that maybe uh but it's got a little bit of grip on it and this this pick is not too heavy not too light and it forms it'll bend it'll form to my fingers or to my thumb, and I like to use the rounded part, not the tip. If I want, because the tip's a little bit lighter, sometimes I'll spin it around and use the tip, but for the most part, I wanna really hold on to this thing, and I wanna be able to use this pick to carve out every ounce of tone that I need to carve out of this guitar for each and every note. So carry your pick with you. That's part of practicing. It's not part of your 20 minutes, but carry your pick around with you. Keep one in your pocket. And you'll be amazed if you carry a pick around with you for one week, what it's going to feel like. Okay. Um, and I'm going to get to some questions here in just a second. I want to finish my train of thought. So carrying your pick with you, practicing the three finger exercises. I'll circle back around and show you finger exercise number two and three here shortly. But finger exercise number one is just one, two, three, four, all the way up. And you move up one fret at a time. And when you get up to the top of your neck, you just work your way back down, okay? And keep your right hand open, touching the guitar or this bottom string because you want your right hand to develop eyesight. Now, it's perfectly okay to look at what you're doing, but you don't wanna have to constantly be looking at every single thing you do. So you want to teach your hand eyesight, okay? So a um, couple of things you can do to really dial in your right hand. Uh, I like to start everybody off with the song, Hey Joe. It has the five chord shapes, all five chord shapes on the guitar, C, A, G, E, and D. Uh, it's the circle of fifths. It's in the key of E, which is the quintessential uh, blues, blues rock key for playing lead. And um, you can play it with open chords and with bar chords. It's an excellent song when you're learning bar chords, and I'll show you why. Let's start with the open chords first, and I'm going to have you uh, do a couple of different strumming exercises to where you make a C chord is the first chord. You're going to hit your root, which is your fifth string, and strum. Then you make a G, hit your root, and strum, sixth string and strum. Your D, fourth string and strum. Your A, fifth string and strum. And then an E7 sharp nine. Now, I want you to play it really super quiet a couple of times, then play it at regular volume, then really super quiet, like, like there was a baby sitting next to you asleep and you didn't want to wake it up. See how I'm feathering the strings? This will help you to maintain and cultivate control. If you can play at a really low volume. Then at a regular volume. So that 
that's one way to really gain control of your right hand to get in touch uh, with the really cultivate the kind of feel that if you close your eyes you know where you are and dynamics 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 so that's the open chord version your bar chords for anybody starting off with bar chords this is a great song to learn this is a c and it's shaped like an a a root five bar chord this is a g it's shaped like an e bar chord d a okay so i teach this song in my blues grit and i've also got uh building a strong blues foundation which is a series that i shot myself in my own studio that's there that uh takes you from start to finish beginner to intermediate uh it originally was an eight week course so it's really a lot of times people will play a lot of stuff but they've got holes in their foundation so you might want to check that out and i do a deep dive down the rabbit hole in that series whereas uh the true fire stuff uh those those videos are very succinct okay so let me look through some of these questions how has my playing been influenced by a strat wow it's been influenced a lot by a strat um, I started out on a telly copy. I had a Les Paul copy for three months. It was a Sears guitar that my dad got me. And I went through three of them. They fell apart, literally. And so they got me this telly copy. And I wish I'd have kept that. It had a maple neck. I had that the first couple of years that I played. Then I got this, a 1965 Fender Strat. Um, there wasn't a scratch on it when I got it. Uh, I got it in 81 and uh, right, out, right out of high school. And I had no idea that this thing was valuable. I wanted a white one um, because I'd seen Hendrix in uh, the Woodstock movie and he played a white guitar. But uh, I'm so glad I got this. This, is, this guitar is just really sweet. I like a rosewood neck. Um, I had uh, a duplicate a copy of this guitar made because there's so little rosewood left on this neck because I've had it. This is my main guitar. So when they uh, measured the neck, it's a little bit smaller here in the middle because I've literally worn it down. But the, the rosewood neck on this, it has, in my opinion, a really sweet sound. So I've got two strats with rosewood necks. And then I had a maple neck cut just like the neck of this guitar. And boy, it sounds different, it's very percussive. So um, strats, just from the maple neck to the rosewood, those can influence your playing a lot. But um, I have a Les Paul and I'll use it in the studio. Seldom do I ever play it live. Uh, I have had, you know, windows where I've toured with, with both the Strat and the Les Paul. I've, I've written a couple of songs with drop D tuning that I needed that really big bat sound on top of that. So there was a time when I traveled a little bit with the Les Paul, but it's a, a strat's like a hot rod. It's flat. And so when I, I've got a really strong, I've got a really strong right hand. I smack this guitar hard and I can do that on a Les Paul but it's a little bit curved on the top. It just, it's, um, it's not a hot rod. That, that, that's the best way I, I can compare the two. So it's really, and, and you have to work so much harder to pull sound out of a Strat. A Les Paul has more weight to it. It's, it's heavier and uh, there's humbuckers. So you've got two pickups. Uh, side by side. It's like having two microphones that you're singing into. So it's got a fatter sound and it just sustain just comes out of a Les Paul. I mean, it just, it just sustains all by itself. Almost a Strat, you've got to have your rig set and you've got to, to really pull with your hands tone out of each and every note. So that has been the biggest thing. One, it, it has kept me constantly on the trail of 
creating the ideal guitar rig. Um, I've got a link that I'll put up. Uh, there's uh, Girl Guitar Magazine did a uh, interview and they, I'll put this in the chat. Uh, let's see, I've got a in two pieces. All right, here we go. All right, I think that went, yeah. Um, that is a link to my blog post. And that has got a video where I shoot, where I shot my rig so you can see my setup. And then it's got a link to that um, interview. And I've got a list of all of the gear that I use in my guitar rig and a link to each of the pedals so you can go check out the individual pedals. And I talk in that, um, in that interview about sound creation, why I chose the pedals that I chose, how I get the tone out of my guitar. I go in depth. And so uh, I'm a gearhead and um, that might be something that you will enjoy reading. Um, so what new players do I dig? Um, you know, I really, um, man, you know, I'm kind of, I've been really into lately the black keys and the white stripes because I've got this, this new uh, power duo going. I've really gone down the rabbit hole and I've gone backwards instead of forwards. I've gone back to a lot of the early Zeppelin, um, dug through the archives of Hendrix. I've gone back through, I've done 16 CDs. So I've gone back through all of my old recordings and decided which songs would transfer well into this duo. So uh, I will say to you, hit me with some new players to listen to um, because I love that. Let's see. Hey, Jimmy from Germany. Let's see. Uh, man, I'm sorry your internet's breaking up. James, hopefully you can get that sorted out. Let's see. Let's see, it's bad luck as a guitar player to not carry a pick at all times. Exactly. You know, it's I'm so attached to this guitar pick, I'm embarrassed to say. I, I would, if I had to sit in with someone, I would really miss this particular guitar pick. Uh, and a guitar strap. Um, the height of your guitar strap is critical. It has everything to do with, with your access to the guitar. Um, I've raised mine a little bit incrementally over the years. Um, I, I don't have mine really high or really low. It's kind of in between. But uh, having your tool with you, this is like a set of paint brushes. If I use the flat end, I can get like my sweet notes. <laughs> see practice in 20 minutes so we don't dread practicing yes yeah uh, you know a couple of things if you set yourself up with unrealistic expectations uh, that's not helpful you know look at what it is you can actually do and and, you know, whatever you put into this thing is what you're going to get out of it. Now, for me, you could not pry this out of my hands. It, but, you know, this is what I did for a living. And I have, as a teacher, I have no expectations that anybody needs to go down the rabbit holes that I've gone down. That's why I'm here to work and hopefully shorten people's process. Um, you know, when I was first learning, I mean, there wasn't YouTube. I had to sit with the record player. <laughs> And, and, you know, rewind, there was no amazing slow downer. There was no YouTube video to tell you how anybody did anything. So it did take a lot longer to figure things out, at least for me. So the advantage of time, really, uh, you can do more in a few hours than, uh, than it took, you know, when you were learning everything from scratch. And there was, I mean, everything. Now, there's an advantage to learning everything from scratch, you know, um, 
but there's also an advantage of having the tools that we have today. Uh, having a, a guitar loop or having something to play with. One, you're having to create that loop and you have something to play with. So play two, let's see. What's your approach in finding sonic space? Uh, playing as a duo or a trio. When I've worked as a trio, a lot of times drummers would join me and if they hadn't played in a trio, they they were constantly wanting to fill in all the holes. Uh, and in, in my opinion, the quintessential three-piece drummer, at least for my taste, was John Bonham. Uh, he kept a pulse. So he would play triplet quarters. But there is that pulse going. Whereas if somebody where it's just fills in every hole, I have trouble playing with that. Um, a real jet like Hendrix's drummer, um, that would not have been my ideal drummer. I prefer more holes. Um, so John Bonham is uh, just kind of the best example. And so that type of pulse being created is one way to sonically leave a hole. Uh, the girl that I'm working with, uh, Sherry McGee on drums, man, you should check her out. I mean, she's very, very much from the school of John Bonham. I mean, it's it's amazing when I, I, I work with her, the holes that she provides for me. So as a duo, one I'll use uh, an octave pedal. I've got a harmonizer, an even tied harmonizer, and I, I promise I left no stone unturned. I tried every single harmonizer on the market. This is the only harmonizer that no matter what, it does not warble, it tracks perfectly. <laughs> So you can't be afraid of holes. One thing that's been unnerving for me as I've done this duo, uh, power duo, is um, it's naked. And you just have to, you know, some points of the, the show, it's like, whoa, you just got to go and not look back and know that it'll be okay. And uh, so those great big fat holes um, work to your advantage. The more I just kind of rest in them and let them speak for themselves, the fatter the sound gets. I also use a uh, ping pong delay. I, I use, I have a triple flashback by TC Electronics. It's three delays in one and you can use all three at the same time. I've got one set up where it's uh, 440 milliseconds. Okay, then I've got one set up with a ping pong and it's and it's uh, 880 milliseconds. So they they stay in sync. I don't know that you can hear that. I'm sitting that direction to the stereo. And it ping pongs, it fades out after 21, five, five, three, four, five, six, seven. That's when it's at its sweet spot for me. Um, and I've got it where it gets out of the way just in time to where I can always stay sonically louder than the, the notes following. But it's loud enough to where it, it, it remains. Okay. So let's see. I'm curious. What was the first concept thing you learned and applied after nailing basic chords and basic scales? Um, that's a good question. Um, I'm answering that. I'm put a little super glue on my finger. I did an Albert King tribute. This has been over a year ago. And um, I got to play with Albert. I love Albert. I don't play his music. <laughs> uh, he bends with his first finger like crazy. And uh, 
it was a King Records tribute, and so I had to do it right. And it pulled the skin from away from my fingernail. Mm. And I still, a year later, have to put super glue on this first finger. It's crazy. Um, it's a flesh wound that, I don't know, it may be with me for the rest of my life. But that's going to be a long time because I'm going to live to be really, really old. I'm determined. So um, when I started doing one, I would play. I always had a mirror set up in my room. And this may sound crazy, but to, to connect with the mirror, you're going to be more comfortable looking at somebody else playing the guitar and following what they're doing. Okay. And I would practice in front of the mirror. And uh, it's a really good idea when I've had my students do this. Some are really skeptical and they'll come back and they'll come back the next week. I'll say, go to Target or Amazon somewhere, get a full length mirror and set it up in front of you and practice in front of it that helps and i would play along with records and i would pretend like i was the guitar player you know period i played along with records non-stop um and i like to find like live records like led zeppelin song remains the same there was one side of uh the record that had like no quarter whole lot of love um and i and i never you know i'd, I'd pick up signature licks i developed my sound my style based on what i could not do i i ripped off everything i could from hendrix and, Z and page and all of the great guitar players ripped off everything that i could but there was so much that i couldn't do so uh that's what turned into kelly ritchie sound you know is, is i did what i could and i did it to death and with with everything that i had so never when you when you go to play, uh, you know, learn something. If you're kind of, you know, fumbling your way through it, at least find one nugget to take from everything that you learn. And then find, you know, a, a, a pocket full of songs. Hey, Joe's great songs that are just like really great, just jams and play, 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 learn to play the guitar and to connect with it. Um, and then I would, I would copy, you know, I, I would copy songs to the best of my ability and then I'd turn it off, man. I wish I, I would have had a studio like I have now to where I could just put on drum loops and uh, create a rhythm track and just play to it. You know, that is the best thing that you can do. And, um, and because you don't have to go out to a jam session to be able to, to have a band to play with today. So, um, hopefully that answers your question. If not, Feel free, okay, Sonic Spaces. Um, did you get, uh, did I learn a lot of theory in the beginning? You know what, I'm, I grew up playing the piano. So I, I encourage everyone to look at a piano and there's all kinds of piano lessons online. If you've never played a piano, take a minute to learn something about it because visually, a piano is, it's like if this were an art project and I said, okay, everybody go home and draw a picture of a major scale. If you came back and had drawn a picture of uh, a piano, you would win the candy bar, okay? Um, because the, the piano is visually a major scale. And so if you can really get that in your, in your head to where you, you can see music, that's helpful. Now, I'm severely dyslexic. My mom was classically trained. I could play by ear. So I grew up playing. And when I started taking lessons, it was not fun for anyone. Uh, that was a painful experience. So I'm really careful when I teach people to play. I want to make sure that they do not have a bad experience learning. Um, so theory for me has always been on a very... Uh, basic level. Well, I, I shouldn't say that. I know theory quite well. I don't think that way though when I'm playing. I play three chords. I play five notes. It's not rocket science what it is that I do. Now, uh, learning your modes and learning all your scales, that's great. And if your brain is wired to think that way, please do it because it can be very, very helpful. 
If you're not wired to think that way, do not worry about it. I like to look at um, my pentatonic scales. There are three minor modes. There are three major modes. Then there's one mode that my teacher always called a demolished mode. It's a diminished mode. It's one that, I mean, you if you want to go, if you find yourself way far outside the box, that's probably where you've landed. Uh, so the four, I'm sorry, the three minor modes have five common notes. That's where we get our minor pentatonics. The three major modes have five common notes. That's where we get our major pentatonics. And so I started when I when I was trying to learn the modes, I found it to be confusing because one, I, I got my blue scale down and just started playing and never really thought about a lot. But then after a while and when I started teaching, it's like, ooh, I need to know what it is that I'm doing. People had questions. And so I went down the rabbit hole and, and learned all my theory. And what I distilled from that that I found to be really helpful when I was teaching is to look at your pentatonic and know that there are three minor modes and there's two notes from each one of those. And I like to call those wild cards that I can pull in to my pentatonics and spice it up. Um, so that's one way that I look at the guitar. And then when you're playing blues, you know, your major, minor and, and dominant seventh chords, you've got to know. And then a minor seventh and a ninth chord, you can get away with nothing more than that, really. You don't have to take a deep dive into theory. Uh, get the basics. Do everything that you can with the basics. Then begin building, uh, deepening your well. Okay. There's, uh, you know, there's a million, I think there's what, 35,000 videos on True Fire uh, that are succinct. They do have a learning path, unlike YouTube, which is great, but there's, there's no guarantee of like a learning path there. So there's every style in the world on uh, True Fire's platform. Just, you know, sit back, grab a cup of coffee and, and just go through things and uh, steal little things from everybody. So that's what I have to say about theory. Um, let's see. What song? Let's see. What was the song you said that we should practice? Hey Joe by Jimi Hendrix. Um, let me turn my. soft and see how I'm feathering the strings when people inevitably new students they hold onto their pick too tight and they they hit the strings too hard you want to feather it see how I'm turning my my wrist cuz when I when my wrist isn't flexible then it's it, it's rigid. We're trying to make music on this. Uh, timing is important. I'd rather hear a wrong note in time than a right note out of time. And so at anybody else in the room, you'd be amazing because if you hit a wrong note, just go in either direction to the next note and it'll be right. <laughs> okay? Just and do it like you meant it and you'll get away with it. If you play something out of time, you are not going to get away with it. You're just not going to. Because uh, if you're playing at a club, everybody, whether they should dance or not, will get up and dance. 
uh, not all of them can carry a tune though. So I'm telling you, timing, you know, so get your timing. And so when you're learning a song before you actually go to play it, break it down and just go through the mechanical motions. To make sure that your hands know what they're doing. Because if you're trying, I watch people and they'll try to play the song start to finish, start to finish, start to finish, start to finish. And it's more than they can bite and chew. And their, their motor skills can't absorb all of it. So therefore, your motor skills don't absorb really any of it. They're kind of getting all of it kind of wrong all the way through it. And then you keep practicing these great big huge chunks kind of wrong all the way through it. So if you can break things down, I mean chunk things down to the least common denominator, like take two chords. Throw Hey Joe out the window and just play the first two chords. Then get all four chords. Turn it into a different song. Chunk down the mechanics of it. Then you can begin to play it. And I was doing a, a harmonic. Let's see. I think, say hey Joe, yep, yep. Who's your favorite guitar tone? Um, you know, Stevie Ray, you can't beat that tone. <laughs> you can't beat that tone across the board. He, yeah, you can't beat that tone. Jimmy Page, oh my God, I love Jimmy Page. Now he played a Les Paul, you know, through a Marshall. He didn't have the same gain structure that I need with the, a Strat. Uh, but I will find that with my Strat, and I and I do have that sound, and it's a, a different approach, you know, gear-wise and, and equipment. But I, I love Page, and I love to listen to Jimmy Page studio uh, recordings, like, and and really break down what's there, and read about how he would record. Um, like with a little one watt uh, Fender Champ with the eight inch speaker, no distortion whatsoever, you know, with his guitar plugged straight in. Uh, I was doing a record, uh, my Carry the Light CD in like 2008, I think. And I wanted the Jimi Hendrix sound. I wanted it to sound like Hey Joe. I went to one producer and was working with him. I was like, man, we could not get the good sound happening. It's like, man, this didn't work. And so I went to a different studio and was working with a guy. First time I'd worked with him and I went in, I told him what I wanted. And he said, okay. So we downloaded the song and uh, he hit play. And I'm like, oh my God, I don't want it to sound that way. I had in my head what I thought Hey Joe sounded like. And I was chasing my tail. So when it comes to guitar tone, uh, it's very uh, much juxt it's juxtaposed to what it is that you're trying to do and play. We we get you know so so constantly go go back and sit with your records and really listen to them and try to match your tone to their tone. Uh, in my blue in my uh, focus on power trio, I talk about my main guitar influences, their guitar rig, my guitar rig, what it was about their sound that influenced me. Um, I, I do a pretty deep dive in that. You might find that interesting. But I did I did my homework and I and I, you know, really got to know the ins and outs and to be able to differentiate between what it is that I liked about the tone. And one other thing I want to say about tone, I uh Warren Haynes, when he was first, uh, before he joined the Almond Brothers, uh, he was in Nashville. He had a band called Blues Co-op, and I'd go uh, see him play every Sunday and then sit in. And uh, he was, one, one week he wasn't there and another guy was there. And it was Nashville. I should have known that any guitar player can play circles around, 
everybody. I mean, it's just, you know, everybody in Nashville really, you're going to find a lot of great players. This guy comes in with a Les Paul and a Polytone amp, which is like a, a jazz, really clean amp. They sold them at the music store where I, where I worked when I was a kid. I didn't like them. They definitely weren't the amp for me, you know, now for a jazz player. And he had this curly guitar chord um, and no pedals or anything. I'm like, oh, man. And whoa. Wow. One of the best guitar tones I've ever heard. And I went up to him after the show and I said, I don't mean to be rude. But how on earth do you get that sound out of that rig? And he looked at me. He said, well, do you ever play your guitar unplugged? It's like, I don't want to have to, you know, and I'm going to keep somebody awake. He said, well, that's your first mistake. I'm like, ooh, ouch. He goes, tone starts in your hands. It starts in your fingers. And if you don't know what your guitar sounds like, then how on earth are you going to be able to amplify it if you don't know what it is that you're amplifying? So um, that's what I think about guitar tone. You can hear all of the players out there. And I've been at many clubs and had people say, hey, you want to sit in? And man, they're rigged. They sound great through it. I go to play through it. I can't get a sound out of it. I'm sitting there like, oh, man, this is going to be a long <laughs> two or three songs, you know, where I really have to work. And I got to really pull the sound out of the guitar because it's not coming from the gear. It's not in attunement with uh you know, how it is that I play and how I feel things. So, uh, you know, when you're, when you're asking a question like that, I just want to take that opportunity to say tone, really dive into tone. And, uh, and it's, it's a deep well. What Wawa pedal do I like? I've got um, a full tone, um, uh, their deluxe i love that pedal it's sweet it takes up a lot of real estate on my pedal board but it is worth it i've tried the little mini wah and they'll sound okay i just you know especially if i've got like platform shoes or you know boots or something on it my foot doesn't fit on it and uh you know it's you got to be able to to really feel it and and that i used to use the vintage vox wah pedals but it got to where they were falling apart i mean they wouldn't last but a few months um and uh but there's nothing as sweet as this deluxe uh full tone wah pedal i've got it on the hendrix setting it's got a built-in buffer um it's nice um let's see now i do um uh, i've got my classroom I do one-on-one uh, -on -one lessons through True Fire. I do Skype guitar lessons all day long. Um, a lot of times I'll have my students get my Blues Grit, my Focus On Power Trio, and uh, either work with me in my classroom where it's video exchange in True Fire, or if you want to sign up with a one-on-one -on -one Skype lesson, it's really great when you have the video series because you can go through it at your own pace you can pick out those spots it's like okay uh the song tears like rain you know two minutes and 10 seconds in what are you doing there and when i put my series together i picked for blues grit i picked song templates to where there's 10 songs and if you learned all of those you're going to have a great foundation for everything blues blues based rock that's out there because it's not rocket science and it'll give you a really good foundation and i pick songs because i've got like over 150 videos on my youtube page if you go to kellyritchie.com uh you can link to my youtube page so there's you know five or six live videos of me playing hey joe or of me playing you know the, the songs that are in my classroom so you can see what it is you've just learned in action uh, of my 16 cds i've done five live cds so there's a lot of real estate in what i'm doing so if you study with me you know it's not just i'm going to show you how to play the guitar i'm going to show teach you how to play the guitar and i'm going to give you what you need to be able to look at it from multiple direct you know on multiple levels learning how to play it having the tools to inch your way through things with any support that you need and then to be able to see it live and in action um and then i've got good rhythm tracks with all of the songs so you can and they're set up they're like 
seven or eight long minute long rhythm tracks for you just get in there and play. Um, uh, what harmoni what harmonizer and delay pedal? I use, and if you look in the feed, you'll see a link that'll take you to a blog post that has a video of me showing you my rig, and it links to a, um, a article that has an in-depth description of my rig and how I create tone. I use an Eventide H9 harmonizer for my uh, octave, and I use uh, a triple flashback by TC Electronics. It has three delays you can use all at the same time or one at a time. You can run them series parallel and you can save each of the presets. Uh, it's a very simple delay. You know, I've had a, uh, you know, a Strymon timeline. I've had every delay out there in the world. Uh, beautiful sounding. But this triple flashback is what I keep going back to. It's simple and it sounds great. It's very clean. Um, even the the digital sound, it's got, I feel like I'm playing through um, an analog delay with all of the digital uh, perks. It's, 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 I love that delay. And, and I run in stereo. I use two, if I'm uh, playing with drums, if I'm playing in the band, uh, I use two deluxe reverb amps in stereo. A lot of ping pong delay. Um, I run two uh, Princeton reverbs when I'm doing a solo show, or if I play an acoustic show, I'll plug into my pedal board and into two Princeton reverb amps. If I'm doing a real stripped down thing, uh, I'll I'll use uh, and using a acoustic guitar, I'll use a couple of powered monitors. So. Oh, owner of a lonely heart, that sound. Um, Trevor Rabin. Oh, my God, I love Trevor Rabin. He, if you can look back at any old guitar player magazines when he was with Yes during that time, he uh, he's masterful at sound creation. I mean, uh, now, the harmonizer, I, I also use uh, a fifth below the note. Um and I'm pretty sure Trevor Rabin um, used that. That I think that's where I picked that up. I was really into Alan Holsworth for a while. He used a harmonizer a lot. I just, my fingers aren't four feet long. <laughs> His fingers are like, you know, I, there's, there's no getting around that for me. But, um, oh, yeah, Owner of a Lonely Heart, that that one record by yes i know yes is great but that was the one record by them that i that i listened to a million times everything else was just a little bit more progressive than my my personal taste and style let's see um you're welcome let's see uh, didn't Paige start with the Telecaster? Yes, and I, what, I think it was called a, was it called a Broadcaster? Here's my understanding, and I'm, I'm not an, I know an awful lot about gear, but there's some holes that I, that I have, uh, if I haven't owned it, <laughs> you know, but when it comes to my effects and my pedal board and, and a Strat and Fender amps, I'm all over that. Uh, I think, he had, and if anybody knows, let me know. I think it was a broadcaster. I'm pretty sure that it only had one pickup and that the other pickup was, was a dummy pickup that was a humbucker. You know, I mean, that, you know, kept that from, uh, you know, like a stacked humbucker it would be, but just side by side. And only one of them was hot. And if you watch the very first, right after Zeppelin 1, there's a black and white movie of them doing a maybe it's the bbc it's a british uh, tv show and they did dazed and confused and um i'm not sure which uh maybe you shook me i don't know but he's playing that guitar and it was paint it was painted paisley oh my god that that is a great 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 um performance and nobody had heard anything like that you know just to look at the audience it was like you know when you think about it, Led Zeppelin, we forget that, you know, Jimi Hendrix, Led Zeppelin, they made 
that was when it was happening. It hadn't happened before like that. Okay. Uh, what do I use for a boost and a distortion pedal? Forever, I use two tube screamers uh, until just two years ago. I mean, I had a dozen two screamers, two in every purse, two under the front seat of my, my vehicle. I mean, I had tube screamers everywhere. Um, and I used both of them turned on at the same time. I had my guitar teacher when he passed, he left me a 65 Super Reverb. And uh, that you know, I was, I didn't know any better. So I carried that amp around and, you know, it was all I could do to keep from getting fired from jobs because it's so loud, you know, I mean, it was so loud to get a sound out of that thing. You had to turn it up on between five and seven. That's when it would break up and sound good. And that wasn't helpful when it was that loud, you know, uh, and you really had to turn it up to get the sound. So I discovered um, after insane i put together a, a guitar rig that was all rack mounted i had two super reverb heads racked up i had channel switching i had it was the size of a refrigerator uh literally and uh i discovered because and i ran that through two powered monitors so i could get my sound with dummy loads and everything finally i i discovered two tube screamers turned on at the same time with your amp on a low volume there you go. I will run my amp, like my Super Reverb, I'm sorry, my Deluxe that I use, Fender Deluxe that I use now. I run the bass all the way up, 100%, wide open. I run the treble halfway, and I put the volume on two. And then uh, when I had, I've switched to the Strymon Sunset, but I want to talk about the tube screamers because they're really simple and I use them forever. Uh, I would have the first tube screamer. I had both of them set on unity when it came to the level straight up to where it was, you know, set at noon. And I had both of them, the tone set at 10 o'clock. And uh, I had the first gain at noon and the second gain at three o'clock. And if I wanted to clean up my sound at all, I would turn off the second one, back my volume down a little bit. And then when I step on the, turn it back on, it just seamlessly, it didn't, it didn't get a lot louder. It just seamlessly, just like you just landed, you know, just kind of took off and landed on a cloud. So that gives me the sustain that I need at a low volume. And it's not a quiet volume at all but it is a low volume and it's tolerable and you won't get fired and you, and you will hear yourself sing and you'll hear everybody else on stage, which you need to, nobody wants to just hear one thing. Trust me. I was that one thing that everybody heard for a lot of years and uh, you know, it has its place, but uh, it's not sustainable. Um, another thing, ear protection. I have tinnitus and uh, I wear earplugs when I play. I caught it just in time. My ears ring 100% of the time, but um, it's, you know, it's, I can live with it and I can still play and I can still mix records. Um, I know what I'm missing and I have somebody check my work to make sure that I, you know, hearing things properly, but please wear ear protection, get some, at least the ones that you buy off the shelf. I have molded ear plugs that I wear. Um, I can't emphasize that enough. And I'm, and I'm very serious about that. Once that goes, that does not come back, period. Um, and I've seen it happen to people extremely young. Um, over time, you know, it, it happens to, to most players. But um, I switched back to my uh, overdrive real quick. I switched to a Strymon Sunset. And um, I would have lost money on that bet. I love that pedal. It's two overdrives in one. And each of them have three different circuits. And you can flip a switch in the back to where you run them A into B or B into A. Um, so that's a lot of power, you know, 
three different circuits on each one, dial in your A pedal, dial in your B pedal, and then, you know, do you want A running into B or B running into A? Then you can buy a foot switch to where you save that sound. You turn it off, plug it in, hold the button down, turn it back on, and it saves that sound. So you can turn that sound on and off. Then you have a whole nother pedal that you can start over with and have. So it's like having four different overdrives. So once you turn on that, that extra foot switch, it goes back to your sound and you can A or B or A and B. You can turn that off and you've got the pedal in front of you. I, I love that sound and it's pristine sounding. And sometimes uh, most overdrives that if I were to use that word pristine sounding, uh, it would be too transparent just not my thing i i like something kind of trashy i had people give me hand wired tube screamers from back in the day and i'd give them back i i liked my old trashy vintage reissue tube screamers i loved them uh so when i got this i was really skeptical and it took me a minute to get it dialed in i mean it did uh, i a beat it with my tube screamers and got as close to it as i could and then I cut the tie and um, yeah. So let's see. My uh, is the sound come from your fingers, not from the effects of doing this. I'm not exactly sure what you mean, but I will take a stab at that and it it reminds me of something I want to share. When I'm playing, I use my fingers in conjunction with my pick because my right hand is a set of paintbrushes. Uh, if you're going to paint a wall, you want a roller. If you're going to put eyelashes on a, on a, you know, a human, if you're painting, you do not want a roller. You want many different sizes of brushes to do what it is that you're doing. So... I'll use my middle finger in conjunction. I'll use these two fingers, my middle and ring finger. Listen to, I'm just touching. Sweet note. I use my middle finger to get that mm. that's my middle finger breaking with my pick my middle finger listen to that as opposed to a when I grab it with my middle finger it I get the oomph that I need okay and then sustain that vibrato to make it ring and pull the sound out. And then I can just touch by using my middle finger, I can get zero to 60 and everything in between. When I use a pick to try to do that, I don't have the same nuance. Okay. Uh, and then I'll sometimes put the pick between these two fingers. I never set it down. <laughs> So let's see. The blues had already happened to you. Have a tone print? No, I do not. I do not. The TC Electronics that I have does not have that feature, or I would. My apologies. Um, let's see. Guitarists have been doing that forever. Turn down the volume, turn it up again, and break. Yes. When you turn your guitar in that gain structure that I was talking about, when I turn my guitar wide open, it puts the most signal through my tube screamers, so the most dirt and sustain is going to come out. When I turn my volume down on my guitar, it puts less signal into those overdrives and it cleans up the sound. So yes, guitar players have been doing that for years, but using two 
tube screamers at the same time gave me that extra overdrive to where I could turn my guitar amp down and get everything out of it at a low volume that I was getting at a high volume. And by backing my tone off, clean up the sound to where it's not, it wasn't just garbage. Um, so getting the right recipe for that for me was critical because I needed to do it at an appropriate volume and I needed a big fat wall of sound without it being a ice pick, you know, hitting people in the front row. Uh, and then even like, you know, on a, on a festival stage, uh, you know, being able to fill up your sound, uh, loud doesn't necessarily carry when you walk away from the, from the direct line of the amp. I'll set my amps up on the side on a big stage blowing across that way, no matter where I'm standing, I hear them. I don't like guitar coming back at me in my monitor. If I need to put it in the middle wedge, I'll do that. But I like just vocal and sometimes a little bit of kick. I like to play as organically on stage as possible. Um, so there's that. Let's see. Uh, when you did the video in your studio, um, which tab software did you use? I hired a guy to do it. I did not, I have not tabbed out any of my stuff. Uh, that's where being dyslexic is just really um, a reality. I just, that's just not my thing. So I happily hired a guy to tab out my stuff for me. Um, let's see, how do I memorize chords better? Um, I have... Um, I have a system. I can put everything on two pieces of paper that you need to know, literally. Um, if you know the names of your notes up and down your fifth and sixth string, and you know an E, E minor and E7, an A, A minor and A7, then you know 72 chords. Let me show you. If you know the names of the notes up and down your sixth string and you take an E chord and you bar it every fret, E, F, F sharp, G, A flat, A, B flat, B, then E minor, F minor, F sharp minor, E7, um, E7, F7, okay? Then same with your A chord. You turn that into a bar, A, B flat, B, C, C sharp, D. You do that with your A, your A minor, and your A7. That's the best system for learning your chords. Then you can learn a minor seventh. You can learn a major seventh. You can learn your ninths. You can stack on top of that. But for learning your basic chords and learning the neck of the guitar, then if you know your root, five and your root six, the names of those notes, knowing your uh, minor pentatonic root five and root six, everything on two pieces of paper. Now, people typically break their pentatonics into five different fingerings. I use two fingerings only and I expand them. Uh, that allows me to play my pentatonics with my first and third finger only and cover the entire neck of the guitar. So I get maximum amount of speed. Not that I want to play fast all the time, but that I can if I need to. Okay. Um, and I've got that in my classroom or in my, in my series, both blues grit focus on and my building a strong blues foundation. Um, you know, I guess there's nothing new under the sun. I didn't, um, you know, uh, it's not the greatest mystery in the world, but the way that I've broken down the neck of the guitar, the simplicity in which I see the neck and have broken it down for students. My entire career as a teacher, people have said, thank you. That's very helpful. They don't see it broken down that simply. So I would encourage you to take a look at it. You know, um, uh, it, my teeth, man, I had a great teacher. I really was fortunate to have a great teacher. He got me the basics and he got me playing fast. Then 
he worked with me to, to, you know, deepen my well, but he had a great system and he said, take it, teach it. And I did with his blessings. Malmsteen. Mm, I can't touch Malmsteen. That's way different style than I play. Miss the uh, Floyd Rose. You know what? I put a, a Kaler on here back when I didn't know better that you don't cut holes in 1965 Fender Stratocasters. So this is one of those lessons in life. When I started playing blues, I put a real bridge back on here. Not that the Kaler isn't a real bridge, but for blues, you need a piece of metal screwed into the wood. You, that floating system, you're not going to get the sustain out of it. Period. Not going to happen. That bridge has got those screws have got to go into and then i've got uh i have this taped up um, uh, so i don't rip up my shirts uh, but i have four of the five springs in here so uh and you know i hardly ever use a whammy bar i i used to uh but with four springs on here if i do put in the whammy bar it'll stay in tune i can just yank it back up uh Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, let's see. Let me scroll up a little bit and see if I've missed anything. Oh, hey, Catherine. How are you doing? I hope to see you in the classroom again. I haven't heard from you in a while. Uh, let's see. Okay. All right, so I've gone over, but I tend to do that. Again, check out Blues Grit, Focus on Power Trio. Uh, Blues Grit has 10 songs, 10 great templates. Uh, Focus on Power Trio, I talk about that riff-driven, power chord-driven sound. I go down the rabbit hole with what it's like to play in a three-piece band, how to create those holes. It's what I do. It's what I know best. Um, now, the uh, power duo that I'm doing, let me, I got uh, a new group called the Spear Shakers, myself and Sherry McGee. I will hit you with a couple of videos. We put out three new videos this last two months. And you all can check those out. There you go. And um, I teach, um, I do Skype lessons one-on-one. -on -one. You can find uh, guitar lessons by Kelly Ritchie or just go to kellyritchie.com. And I love to teach. I've been teaching almost as long as I've played. I think I've been playing less than two years when I started teaching. Uh, you know, being dyslexic, uh, school was not easy uh, for me. I learned to hide, you know, the the disability. And so I became a passionate teacher because I was a wounded student. I love to teach the guitar. So if I can help anyone, uh, you know, hit me up for a lesson, I will make it worth your time. Uh, I like to use the leverage, the video series that I have. So you have something to work with at home. Uh, I don't like anybody ever getting off a call and wondering, wow, what did she say? What am I supposed to do? 20-minute uh, practice sessions, sit down, warm up with your finger exercises. Uh, also, I will leave you with this, a hand strengthening exercise. Open your hand all the way, close it all the way. Don't cheat in either direction. Open it all the way, close it all the way, and build up to 300 of these. That's another thing. You can carry your pick around with you all day and you can do this finger, this hand exercise for strengthening. Um, and so that and 20 minutes a day and you'll be amazed. Seriously. Consistency. OK. And uh, when you play your finger exercises, play them perfectly. You're, you're, you're learning what it is that you're playing. So rushing through something with a lot of fret buzz, miss notes, you're just play, you're learning to do it wrong. So slow down, do it right. And once your 20 minutes is done, throw that out the window, play and have fun. If you practice properly, everything you do will sound better. I don't care if you've been playing 
a long time, if you're in a rut, if you're stuck, get a practice routine, practice 20 minutes every day and it, and then throw, throw it out the window. It will show up in your playing. Okay. But consistency is really it. And, and you'll be amazed at what 20 minutes a day will do. Carry your pick around, do your hand exercises. And um, I think that's it. See if there's any last burning questions. Uh, any tips for keeping your students from going down the rabbit hole? <laughs> Focus on one song at a time or else. You know, I think going down the rabbit hole is good. Um, focusing, you know, perfecting one song uh, is way better than kind of learning 20 songs. Now, there's advantages to learning a lot of material. But if you perfect, like I made Hey Joe my own. I mean, I own that song. And it shows up in everything that I do. So I had that pocket of songs that I went down the rabbit hole with all the way, cracked my head all the way down the rabbit hole. But I learned, you know, it, it's really about building your sound, building your technique. And if you find a song that's fun to jam on, learn to play lead on those simple songs. Uh, learn how to pull sound out of your guitar, how to get sustain, how to get control. And then, um, you know, find songs like that. So, so what you're learning transfers, you know, and then, you know, it's, it's great. You know, sometimes I'll, I mean, I've been in the Kelly Ritchie band for so long, but every now and then I'll take a side project um, where I'll have to learn a whole bunch of songs and it's really good for me. So not everybody's going to agree with me on that, but that's what I think. My timing is bad. Um, you're very welcome. Timing. Here's a simple exercise. Two, three, four. And don't sit still when you when you play. You've got to feel what you're doing. You want to create a pulse. You can sit here when you're watching TV, whatever you're doing. You can sit here like this with your pick in hand and just one, two, three. Or, but make sure you're feeling it from your toes to the top of your head and do this until you do. And then eighth notes, one and two and three and four and quarters, two, three, four, one and two and three and four and one, two, three. And then sixteenths, one and two and three and four and one. See the pulse, three and four and one. To, and switch between those. I've got on my YouTube page, I've got a rhythm exercise on there. There's a, a playlist for live videos. There's a playlist for guitar lessons. There's a playlist for gear, all of my incarnations of gear, my big monster pedal boards. Um, so, um, yeah, rhythm. A lot of what it is. That my right hand is my strong point rhythmically. Uh, I've got a lot that I teach when it comes to breaking down rhythm uh, and that, you know, playing one note a million different ways is um, very valuable. Let's see. Uh, music is the name of that icon. Cool. I hope to see you uh, as a student. Let's see. Um, sweet. Oh, what was the le best live band that I've ever seen? Well, I didn't get to see Zeppelin. God, you know, there have been a couple. I saw Aerosmith back in the day. I was in junior high school. That, uh, that was great. And then I saw them after they broke up and got back together. Uh, they opened up with Back in the Saddle. That was brilliant. I got to see, uh, you know, I got to see Rush, but I've seen, I've been to see Rush in the last, you know, eight years. And I've, I've paid for good seats. Rush, I love that band. And I'm not huge on progressive rock. I love that band. I love their first three records. Um, and they're all the world's a stage live record. So they were great live. Um, what are a couple of things that I've seen? 
I mean, I saw Hart back when they were um, the original members. I saw them like five times. It was the first concert uh, that I, I went to and I saw Hart. Um, whoa, they were amazing. I was a huge fan. Um, who else? God, I've seen everybody. I'm trying to think of those magical shows. Um, you know somebody I saw recently, Tommy Emmanuel. Holy crap. <laughs> I knew he was good. I'd seen some videos and everything. That was an amazing show. If you haven't seen him, go, go. Uh, I saw a girl from Australia in San Francisco. I was out there for my birthday in November. Um, Tash... Um, oh, she was her last name. She loops, she plays solo. Um, I've got, I'm drawing a blank on her last name. I have to post that. There's, there's, um, uh, Australian, her first name's Tash, T A S H. Um, she, that man, she was great. Um, I don't know. I'm drawing a blank. I've seen some really great shows. Uh, learning how to count really helped me with my rhythm. Yes. One, two, three, four, one and two and three and four and one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a. Yes. That is so critical. When I, I remember when I first learned that and I had this teacher, man, he was, I've had a couple of really mean teachers <laughs> and uh, he'd make me play all of my scales, all of my finger exercises using these one, and, you know, one and a two and, and then going to triplets, one triplet, two triplet, one and, and, and I had to do that with the metronome. And I mean, I he wouldn't let me leave until I nailed it, and it was, it was painful. Am I from Canada? Uh, no, I grew up in Lexington, Kentucky, and I live in Cincinnati. That's where I am right now. I was originally in a band on Arista Records, Stealing Horses. That's who I first toured with. Uh, that took me to Nashville. I was in Nashville for about five or six years. Ah, Sultana, Tash, Sultana. That's the girl. Thank you so much. That was gonna bug me. She, man, that was. She, there's some uh, on YouTube. Her bedroom tapes. Uh, she was uh, busking in Australia and got on a Netflix. Uh, they were interviewing, I guess, buskers, and uh, that's how people got hip to her. But there's some uh, her bedroom tapes. She loops and stuff. I do a lot of loop-based stuff, a lot of trip hop, a lot of ambient, a lot of soundscape. Um, I'm getting into that more and more and more. I do life coaching, and um, I am about to graduate in May as a spiritual director. So I do. A lot of stuff along with guitar. Let's see. Steve Vai helped me to play deep. Steve Vai is great. I mean, he really is. Again, and he's not like uh, Malmsteen. I mean, he's got more. I don't want to say Malmsteen doesn't have soul. He does. Uh, Steve Vai always surprises me at how much soul he has, given how many notes he plays. He's... Man, he's a rock star for a reason. <laughs> he's he's great. Uh, yeah, Tommy on YouTube, he's unreal. Wait till you see him in person. Oh, man, his, his show is amazing. Uh, yes, so you saw her this summer. Yes, she was vicious. She was great. I saw her at the um, in Oakland at the theater there she had two sold out shows and we uh my friends got me up we, we got uh vip and uh man that was fun ah there's another person who's dyslexic <laughs> uh do i have a buffer on my board yes i have two buffers on my board i have the is it the ghs i think uh which is a little gold box it's got a picture of a like a magic rabbit hat or something, a magician pulling a rabbit out of a hat. Um, and it's a buffer and a boost. I keep it on 100% of the time. It's the first thing in my chain. 
and uh, I keep it turned up halfway with that turned on that boosts everything. It's got a built-in buffer. Then I go into my uh, deluxe uh, full tone wall. And uh, then I go into a compressor, which I got a Strymon compressor and I, it's the first, I have never used a compressor except in the studio, like with an acoustic guitar when I'm recording. I'm using a compressor now and I got the Strymon, uh, that gold compressor of theirs, real simple, three knobs and a boost. Love that thing. Love it. Um, and my wah has a, a buffer on it as well. So I definitely have uh, plenty of buffer power. Um, so I'm going to wrap things up here. Let me scroll through more things. Cool. All right. Well, it's been nice to be here with you all. Appreciate you all tuning in. And, um, you know, if you want a lesson, I teach. Uh, I love to do Skype. I've got the True Fire Classroom for video exchange. Um, I've got my series. I've got um, a lot of stuff on YouTube. So go steal anything that you can. I've got a ton of stuff, uh, performances where I'm playing, you know, live where you can see what it is I'm talking about in action. Um, there's uh, one version of Red House that True Fire put up on Guitar Player TV a number of years ago. That, if you watch that, you'll see everything I know twice rolled into one song uh, from zero to 60. That's, uh, that has a really good representation um, of every, you know, breaking it down to really quiet and playing octaves and sweet notes and syncopating and that that's got a lot of stuff in it so watch maybe watch that one performance um and then um yeah so that's it um blessings to everyone thank you so much for tuning in uh, i love doing these i love true fire great platform again there's thirty-five thousand videos go down that rabbit hole <laughs> 20 minutes a day don't forget carry your pick with you hand exercises and you can win money doing this uh you know, go up to the, you know, strongest person and say, hey, I bet you $100 you can't do this 300 times. <laughs> You'll win if you can do it. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, your hand will start burning. Isometrics, the grippers, I do not like those. I do not like those. I think that you can get hurt. Uh, being a female, I'm strong for a girl, but I'm not as strong as a guy. I don't. No matter how hard I work, no matter how many weights I lift, I'm not. So my hand strength is really important. And I've got a whole lot more hand strength than any of my guitar students because that fine, you know, I won't beat them in arm wrestling, but that fine muscle attunement I've got. And this is my main go-to exercise. Okay. All right. Cool. Y'all take care and uh, I will see you around. Okay. Bye-bye.